Well, good morning and welcome everyone to this meeting of the Animal Welfare Intergroup. Uh, it is good to see so many of you, despite that it's a busy time for all of us. Um, this Thursday and Friday, the Environment Committee will vote on Cesar Luena's report um, on the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030, bringing nature back into our lives. The biodiversity strategy uh, contains a series of very important amendments uh, related to animal welfare and species con uh, conservation. And many of them were introduced by members of the animal welfare intergroup. This morning, the intergroup secretariat sends you a voting list prepared jointly with um, several animal welfare organizations with suggested uh, recommendations. And there is more. Last week, the Agri Committee adopted its resolution on End the Cage Age uh, European Citizens Initiative. And uh, the committee calls on the European Commission to propose a revision of the Council Directive uh, uh, 9858 uh, on the protection of animals kept for farming purposes with the objective of phasing out the use of cages in EU animal farming possibly by 2027. It also requires that animal products imported to the EU are produced in full compliance with the relevant EU legislation, including the use of cage-free farming systems. And the Conference of Presidents has already agreed uh, that there will be a debate with a resolution uh, on the European Citizens Initiative uh, to end the cage age during the uh, first plenary session of June. I hope that many of you will speak up for animals. The cage-free working group of this intergroup will definitely table some amendments to strengthen the text. And I hope I can count on your support to convince your colleagues in your group to vote in favor. Before we start, I would like to uh, highlight some practical uh, aspects for the, uh, the running of this uh, session. Uh, the meeting is uh, live streamed on Facebook. There is no interpretation and all those who want to intervene are invited to speak in English. Uh, please add your questions using the Q&A function uh, and they will be answered after the presentations. The debate will be moderated by Reineke Hameleers uh, from the Intergroup Secretariat. And please keep yourself muted during the entire meeting unless you are given the floor by Reineke or myself. If you are an MEP and you wish to take the floor, please let us know by using the chat box or raise the hand if uh, the function is available to you. Given the short time we have for the meeting, I would like to ask colleagues to be brief and uh, uh, have short questions and statements. The webinar will be recorded. Uh, the video recording and the presentations will all be published on the intergroup's website after the session. So now it is time to start with our program. Today we will speak about the shortcomings in the implementation and enforcement of Directive 2010-63 on the protection of animals used for scientific purposes. And um, we will also discuss the urgent need for an EP position calling for an EU action plan to accelerate the transition to innovation without the use of animals in uh, research, regulatory testing, and education. And this could be achieved by an EP plenary debate and linked motion for a resolution before the EP summer recess. Um, let me now introduce the speakers of today's meeting who will tell us more about this. Uh, we, we start with the undercover footage of uh, cruel abuse at, at the Madrid-based uh, contract research organization Vivo Technica. Uh, this has recently caused a public uproar. Vivo Technica uh, secured funding from the EU and Spanish authorities for projects in, involving experiments on a range of animals, including monkeys, dogs, uh, mini pigs, rats, mice, and rabbits, uh, for the biopharmaceutical, chemical, cosmetic, tobacco, and food industries. 
And between 2018 and 2020, footage was taken by a whistleblower who worked at the facility and uh, that was published by Cruelty Free International. And Dr. Katie Taylor and um, uh, Carrie Postlewhite, uh, uh, respectively a CEO and Director of Public Affairs of Cruelty Free Europe, will go in into further detail about the practices revealed at Vivo Technica and propose measures that should be taken uh, to chance uh, the behavior and um, in laboratories. Uh, so Katie and Carrie, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anya, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to, to present our findings here and to start the discussion about uh, need for improvement of uh, Directive 201063. Uh, I'll just share my screen. So I can see you, Anya. Can you nod if you can see the presentation? Yes, perfect, yes, Katie. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Annika. So, uh, as Annie said, um, a whistleblower came to us um, towards uh, at the very end of last year um, with uh, their experiences at uh, Vivitechnia. Um, and uh, after processing um, the information and the footage and doing uh, due diligence, um, the findings were released uh, by the Guardian newspaper in the UK in April and uh, were followed immediately uh, by El Diario in, in Spain and, and have really hit the headlines since then. Um, so Vivitechnia is a contract testing facility based in Madrid. Um, it's a key testing facility. In fact, it, it has a, a key um, uh, selling point in that it does uh, tobacco testing uh, for companies um, as well. So this is an example of the uh, of the tubes that, that rats are placed into uh, to do inhalation studies uh, with tobacco or, or other chemicals. Um, and of course, as we, we commonly see, these, these laboratories um, often claim uh, that animal welfare is paramount important and very much at the forefront of their minds. And yet, what we what we found there was uh, really the, the direct opposite of that. Um, what we found were actually um, in this case incidents of actual physical abuse, um, extremely poor attitude towards the animals, a lot of verbal abuse, um, which is indicative of a very very poor culture of care, um, and extremely poor handling uh, of all the animals, uh, particularly the rabbits. Um, and this is a rabbit who's who's very very sick indeed and, and has a, a broken spine. Actually, is about to be killed um, because it uh, fell on the floor uh, because it wasn't being handled properly. Uh, we also found poor housing for the animals, a lack of enrichment consistently for the dogs and the pigs in particular, a uh, lack of exercise facilities, um, enrichment, toys, bedding, really key things that are in the directive that should have been there. Um, evidence that potentially they were doing tests um, where there are alternatives. This is, this is an example of a, a Dre's eye irritation test being conducted on rabbits, which has been replaced. There are also skin irritation tests on rabbits being rout routinely offered as well. We have valid alternatives for that. So there's a big question there as to why the laboratory was doing those tests. And uh, several examples of standard procedures done without sedation where it's common practice that actually these animals should be uh, not just sedated, but uh, examples of tests where they should have been very, very heavily sedated if not already killed. Uh, at the point at which the procedure should have been done. Um, so um, I'll, I, I will unfortunately now um, present to you the video, um, which is very distressing, um, I warn you. Um, I do appreciate you um, Being, uh, being prepared to watch it. Um, it's about eight minutes long and, uh, hang on, let me just stop here. I just want to make sure that, um, yeah, that you'll be able to hear it. If somebody could shout, if you cannot hear it for me, please, that would be appreciated. 
Uh, just be careful that the, there's no pets around or young children, please. This film is a tribute to the millions of animals who suffer and die in toxicity testing across Europe every year. Animals who are poisoned with drugs and chemicals that they are forced to inhale have dripped into their eyes, pushed into their stomachs, rubbed into their skin, or injected into their bodies. This never before seen footage was taken during a recent undercover investigation in a major contract testing laboratory in Spain. It is a compelling and moving account of life, extreme suffering and death for the dogs, monkeys, rabbits, pigs, rats and mice held captive and subjected to procedures against their will. The tests are distressing, painful and traumatic, and animals suffer greatly, even dying from the toxic effects of the chemicals and drugs pumped into their bodies. For many animals, however, this is only part of the nightmare. We are often told that animals are treated humanely in laboratories and well cared for by compassionate staff who are legally responsible for their well-being. The reality, however, is very different, as it was here. As well as violating European and Spanish legislation, staff at this laboratory showed a callous and uncaring attitude towards the animals who depended on them for their care, even while some of them lay dying. Traumatized animals, taunted, mocked, and subjected to verbal and physical abuse. Rough handling and incorrect restraint just added to the animal's distress and suffering. Rabbits suffering spinal injuries because of mishandling and worker incompetence. Rats and mice shaken violently to subdue them. Procedures such as collecting blood, often poorly carried out by impatient and abusive staff. Some procedures carried out without anaesthetic against accepted animal welfare guidelines. Blood taken from the eyes of fully conscious rats. Mm -hmm. 
and the hearts of conscious moving mice punctured to collect blood. During dosing, the animal's mouth was forced open and a tube or cannula pushed down their throat. The test chemical or drug was then injected rapidly without always first ensuring that the tube was in the stomach, not the lungs. Such negligence can have tragic consequences. This pig died after the test substance was injected into his lungs. Other animals suffered from the small barren conditions in which they were kept. No meaningful enrichment was provided, causing the animals high levels of stress, resulting in stereotypical behavior. And at the end of the tests, animals were killed often by carbon dioxide inhalation or lethal injection. <laughs> the baby rats had their heads cut off. Sometimes the killing was callous. The most sickening behavior was displayed by staff when they were killing rabbits and rats. This rat was cut open while still alive. This cruelty must not be tolerated. We call on the Spanish government to close this laboratory down immediately. We say to European decision makers that the time has come to end drug and chemical testing on animals. This is not an isolated incident. In 2019, similar suffering was revealed at a laboratory in Germany. This is the reality for animals in laboratories in Europe. This must end now. We need your help. Join us in seeking justice for these individuals and all the other victims of an outdated industry that is responsible for the suffering and deaths of millions of animals poisoned in drug and chemical tests every year. Uh, thank you for watching that. Um, it's always difficult to watch that. Um, I think there's two two points I'd like to make following that is that this is not an isolated incident, and actually a lot of what you saw there was actually standard. That is the reality of toxicity testing in Europe. Some of those procedures, some of those cages, are standard. Some of it is clearly abuse and a, and a bad facility. We've done uh, various investigations over the recent years since uh, the implementation and at the start of the directive. Uh, we've done several in the UK, three in Germany now and, and one in Spain. There's actually common features in all of those investigations and these are the things that we need to talk about today. 
we are consistently seeing that there is no overnight care for these animals, even animals that have undergone surgery that day. Consistently poor handling practices, incidents of cruelty, tests being done where there are alternative methods and severe suffering beyond that, which was anticipated by the researchers themselves um, and consistently no enrichment of cages. We've seen that consistently in the, in the last three investigations in Europe and also in, in the UK as well. This is not an isolated incident. We have, we have a problem here. We have a, we have a big problem. And in particular, none of this was picked up by inspectors in any of these countries. So that's an immediate problem that we have. Particularly enrichment of cages, that should be a no brainer. You can see that with min the minute you walk into a laboratory, we've got a problem. I'll just move on to Kerry now, thank you. Can everybody now see my screen? It's the bit I always dread on these calls. Yes, yes, we can see that. Thank you, Ryan Khan, and, and thank you, Anya. I'm going to start by picking up on the point that Katie left you with. Um, and when I was putting my slides together, I used a template that we had prepared for a meeting we had in the European Parliament in November in 2019, which is not that long ago, uh, which Sylvia Spurek helped us to organize and I know some of you were at. Uh, and what was shocking is that Katie and I gave a very similar presentation to that meeting uh, about our investigation with Soko Tierschutz at LPT in Germany. And now obviously we're sharing with you the information from Vivotechnia um, and I think what we all here want to avoid is that we come back in another 18 months time in 2023 with another Max Planck or another LPT or another Viva Technia. And I think, you know, this is the discussion that we all of us here need to have. And as parliamentarians, you will know better than anyone that the European public wants all of us to do something about this and to change this situation. We did some cruelty-free Europe polling with Savanta Comres last June uh, and found that three quarters of adults in EU member states think the EU should invest more in the development of alternative methods to animal testing. Seven in 10 agree that enabling the full replacement of all forms of animal testing should be a priority for the EU. And the kickers, Nearly three quarters of adults in EU member states agree that the EU should set binding targets and deadlines to phase out testing on animals. And two thirds agree that the EU should immediately end all animal testing. So I think the voice of the European public is really clear. And I think it's the responsibility of all of us uh, to do whatever we can to change the situation. We launched a change org petition when we published the findings from Vivotechnia, and this was the situation as of this morning, 700,000 people assigned that petition to close Vivotechnia, but also not just to close Vivotechnia, but to make all of us look fundamentally um, at animal testing in the EU. So what can we all do? Katie mentioned some of the key standout flaws with the enforcement and implementation of Directive 2010-63 that we've uncovered in these investigations. And yes, better enforcement of that directive is obviously uh, really crucial. And that's not just something for the Commission. That would be a really unfair thing to expect. It's also for all of our member states um, to ensure that they are doing too. And as Katie pointed out, the system of inspections in Madrid and in Spain was clearly failing the animals at Vivotechnia. Uh, where else is that happening? We know from our experience in the UK that the number of inspections taking place in laboratories has fallen sharply over the last few years. 
uh, whilst a number of procedures and facilities hasn't. So we have uh, an inspection issue. We also need more parliamentary scrutiny. So um, that's you know at a European level and at, at a member state level um, of continued animal experimentation in Europe. But I think the lessons that we have to draw from all of this is that we have a flawed and inherently cruel approach, uh, which we need to change uh, and we need a paradigm shift. So enforcement of the directive is important, but it's also about changing the system. Um, 11 years ago, Directive 2010 was, was adopted. Uh, and we hear the commission saying a lot, including from Commissioner Sinkovicius in conversation, Anya, with yourself uh, and with Tilly and other members of, of the parliament, that the directive is in and of itself, the strategy to replace and reduce the use of animals in experiments in Europe. And we would dispute that. We think it's a very important piece of legislation and a grand piece, groundbreaking piece of legislation, but it is not a replacement and reduction strategy. Uh, the Commission itself says on its website that the aim of the directive is to improve welfare uh, and to strengthen legislation. The Commission also says on its website about the directive that it has three key objectives, uh, and that's the internal market and enhancing competitiveness, which I always find a little bit mind blowing when we're talking about animals and experiments, uh, high standards of welfare and improving transparency none of those three key objectives for the directive that the commission states on its website are about reducing and replacing uh, having a phase out strategy to end animal experiments so it is the bigger picture there are things that the commission could be doing now it has um, the power to initiate periodic thematic reviews in the directive and we need to see those happening urgently um, and we need action from member states with regard to the directive. And we welcome the quick reaction from the government of Spain in response to the Vivo Technia news. In Spain, there is a general directorate of animal rights um, at the center of government. Uh, and they, with the Ministry of Science, uh, Universities, Innovation, Agriculture, Fisheries and Food have set up a working group to advance the reduction of animal experiments. And I think that joined up approach, which is similar, I know, to the TPI initiative in the Netherlands and is something that Cruelty Free Europe has been calling for the Commission to institute. So that joined up approach of all the different players um, to come up with some reduction and replacement plans we think is critical. So that would be DG Envy, DG Grow, DG RTD, DG Health and GRC. So we, you know, we'd like to see coming out of this, them joining up and looking at plans. Uh, in respect of what the parliament can do and parliamentary scrutiny so the commission very helpfully now produces statistical reports of the number of animals used in uh, scientific procedures in the european union the report for 2018 and susanna will correct me if i'm wrong is due imminently and for 2019 at the end of this year and the commission also presents implementation reports periodically of the directive the next one of those is due in 2023 those reports are communicated by the commission to the parliament the agriculture committee is the lead committee responsible in the parliament but time and again those reports are just noted as communications received from the commission in the minutes of the coordinators meeting perhaps it's time for the lead committees to actually start interrogating those reports to find out whether this directive that the parliament co-owns is being properly instituted. And I think the other thing that parliamentarians can usefully do is raise this issue with their parties. So the German Greens are going into this year's Bundestag elections with a manifesto commitment um, to a clear exit strategy uh, from animal experiments. If we could replicate that across all political parties and across all member states, then we would start our momentum for change. And I think finally, you know, recognizing what we're saying about this not being one bad apple, albeit a very, very bad apple, Vivo Technia, but about a system that's inherently cruel and inherently bad science. Um, I think what we could all usefully do is support the call for an action plan to phase out animal experiments in the European Union. And I know that the Intergroup Animals and Science Working Group under the leadership of Tilly has been doing a lot of work in this regard um, and recognizing the logic that we can take from European Union commitments around climate change 
uh, emissions, uh, women on boards, for example, uh, and carrying that logic over to, to a phase out plan for animal experiments in the EU. Thank you, Reinika. Well, thank you so much, uh, Katie and, and Carrie, for your uh, presentations and also for uh, thank you for showing us this this shocking uh, video. It was really heartbreaking and um, I know it is difficult uh, to watch and um, I still think it's unbelievable what human beings are capable of and and the suffering of animals and, and just turning a blind eye. And um, well, uh, let's say it is difficult to, to find the good words and to continue uh, after watching this video, but nevertheless, um, we are going to move on to our uh, next presentation. And I have the pleasure to, to give the floor now to Susanna uh, Luhimis. She's policy officer at the DG uh, Environment of the European Commission, who has spoken in this intergroup for uh, several occasions already. And she will speak about uh, Vivo Technica, uh, Vivo Technia uh, uh, case from, uh, from the Commission's perspective. And uh, she will give us a general update about the directive 2010-63. Uh, Susanna, you have the floor. Thank you, Anya, and I uh, trust you shout if you don't hear me. Um, thank you for the invitation. I think it's important that we can discuss these issues together. Let me just share my slides with you. And uh, I will do a 10 minute marathon now. Um, First of all, before diving into the issue of vivotechnia, I really want to echo a little bit also what Kerry said. And I think we need to step back and recognize what you have achieved with your colleagues and member states when you negotiated this uh, directive. Um, I am not aware of a single jurisdiction anywhere in the world that has a full replacement noted down in the legislation. There are some where the three R's are legal obligation, but very few outside of the EU. Um, we also have elements there that contribute to the development and validation of alternatives, non-animal methods. But I think one of the key elements which is often forgotten, and, and when I talk to my colleagues in other regions, they are almost envy of, because this is a directive, which is a horizontal piece of legislation, it means that no future policy in initiative, no future legislation can go against these objectives set out in this uh, directive. So it is an extremely important piece of legislation. Now, we uh, heard about a talk about uh, enforcement of the legislation. Now, first of all, I think what you managed to negotiate contains also extremely good structures, responsible named persons in authorizations, responsible for the welfare and care of animals and to safeguard the compliance. But ultimately, we talk about national legislation, which is in force, and the member states have the sole responsibility of the enforcement of national legislation. Now, looking at that, I think we need to separate what is legislation and what is mal-intentional, uh, malpractice, intentional infringements of legislation. And I have to say, well, I was equally shocked to see this. This should not happen in today's EU with the legislation that we have managed to achieve. And we strongly condemn these scenes that we have been seeing in these videos. So this is definitely not something we want to see. As you already mentioned, uh, the Spanish authorities were extremely fast in reacting. Uh, the day after they were notified, they already carried out the first inspection and they, um, they they are currently continuing the inspections and we expect them to do that in full. So what has Commission done? We are in discussion with the Spanish authorities on this one and they are continuing the investigation. But um, we had a lucky situation in terms of timing. We just had a member state national contact point meeting on the 5th and 6th of May. And that gave us a good opportunity to discuss about elements that you just mentioned, inspection and enforcement. And it was extremely good uh, discussion. We talked about how can inspection identify 
intentional malpractice when it is easy to hide if uh, for the elements that you can hide. Obviously, stereotypic behavior would be developed over developing over time, but there are um, malintentional poor practices that can be hidden. And even if we look at unannounced inspections, we face a problem because before going through our hygienic, the, um, the disinfecting showers, the protective gear before you can enter the place, you already lost 15, 20 minutes. So un un announced inspections are really not only solution for this. So we really discussed what kind of elements we can pick up. And it goes to um, assessment of culture of care. How can you identify elements that would be indicative of good or bad um, culture of care? Just the supporting structures, uh, are they working? What kind of meeting minutes will you have from animal welfare bodies? And then we discussed about the attainment assessment and maintenance of competence, which then continued to the afternoon for the whole, uh, whole afternoon, which was the main focus on education and training. We also discussed something that have not been mentioned before here. Uh, it's a whistleblower directive that is going to be implemented by the member states by the end of this year. And this, I think, will be helpful for us. Now, what can member states um, do? What can MEPs do in terms of help us work together to improve the enforcement? I think one of the issues would be to look at the structures available for the member states, the, the resources available for enforcement. What about academic institutions? What are their resources available in order to maintain uh, an ineffective culture of care? So thinking about elements that can help maintain good culture of care, good structures in place and have inspections that are effective. Moving on to the um, ultimate goal of full replacement. How can we m move this uh move towards this goal more rapidly. As um, I will go through the last uh, of my slides, the second part of my slides, I will talk about transparency, education and training, and I will just be able to give you a couple of examples of focused activities that the Commission is undertaking. Now, transparency. Um, I think, Kerry, you mentioned that you don't see anything uh, in the three aims that would be looking forward to the uh, ultimate aim. I think transparency is an extremely important element in this uh, context. We can talk about the revised statistics and also non-technical project summaries. But why do I say that these are important elements? First of all, they set the baselines. Uh, we can assess trends and differences. We can understand why certain areas require more animals, why are the civil is more important. We can deduct information on three hours already in use. Can we draw that and make it more widely available? And what new three hours elements do we have? And ultimately, uh, you mentioned thematic reviews. I agree. It's a time that we will start looking at the thematic reviews. We have had super busy agenda putting all these things together. But I think that uh, this will give us a good tool to start prioritizing initiatives as well as research efforts. Now, if you remember in 2019, we amended the directive and we focused on the transparency measures exactly for this reason. We wanted more accuracy, more objectivity. We wanted the speed of publication and access to data. And um, I'm happy to say that instead of uh, derogating just reports, we actually will be er derogating data, whoever wants to derogate that, because the EU will have, again, first in, in the whole world, we will be having databases that we, will be available for anyone who needs to uh, look at that data. There will be statistical data, but also non-technical summaries will be available for derogation for you and your colleagues. Now, the statistical database, hopefully this or next week already. So really please come back to our website and see when it's gonna be up and open. And the non-technical project summaries we hope to be able to open in July. Now, education and training. Um, very quickly, um, being a daughter of two teachers, I really value education and training. And this is, I think, where we can start changing the landscape and the mindset of the people. Now, thanks to the funding of, from you and your um, foresight in how we can use uh, funds for education and training, we have e-modules that have just been published. There will be two more coming up. And we are currently discussing what kind of e-modules we will be using uh, and developing in the future with this next set of funding. And here, I think for me personally, the two key uh, modules that we want to get out is one for the inspector and one for competence assessor. So attacking the Thai part of the enforcement on one hand, but then also making sure that the people on the shop floor who actually are with the animals will be uh, treated competently and they know how to do the procedures.
On the other hand, we also want to target the very young ones. So we are actually targeting already seven to 19 year olds and this work will continue. There is a second uh, three hours massive open online course MOOC coming up in the autumn and we just started the media campaign last week. And this is the work that we are doing together with the URL Ekvam. Now, a couple of other examples, what we have been doing. Um, this is work from JRC, and they are really going into the area of biomedical research, basic and, and applied research. And that's the area where actually most animals are used, not in toxicological uh, testing carried out by CROs. And here they have identified seven areas and out of which already three results are available. And you can see what's, what's available. There will be reports, there are reports already Ready. But most importantly, they have catalogs of non-animal methods and models that are being used in these areas. Now, this brings me to the second example I wanted to take. A um, couple of years ago, there was a, a workshop organized by JRC, uh, how to bridge across the models and methodologies used in one area of bio biological research to another. And do we have even a similar language? And um, there was a report uh, that came out of that. And this work is now continuing in terms of using now the Im information that we're getting from these disease areas that I just mentioned on the previous slide. There's a workshop, workshop coming up and we now could be building on the, the BEAMS initiative and then taking concrete examples and see how we can start moving the goal, um, goalpost. Final uh, comment I wanted to quickly mention was the scientific conference that we organized in February. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details. Um, it was extremely successful. We had over 1,300 registered participants covering um, African region, uh, Australasia, uh, South and North America, uh, some Middle East, and uh, we felt that we had extremely good discussions. The report, presentations, videos, etc., will be available shortly on our website. So the same place and address to go to. So in concluding my 10 minutes a marathon, um, I, um, I want that we have appreciation of what we have achieved together. We have a unique legislation. Now we need to make sure that we all uh, embrace it. It has the full replacement as the ultimate goal. We have legally binding stepwise approach when we get um, alternatives to implement them. But why do we still want to improve the welfare? Because we are not going to be there tomorrow. We need to make sure that we can also have the tools available that allows us to protect the animals that we are still using in the years to come. We need to work together. I, I really, um, I, I like the, what you said earlier that we, it's not only the commission, it should be everybody's in um, best interest to make sure that the legislation and laws we adopt, we also embrace, we in, implement them and we enforce them. And I think it's now high time to start using the transparency tools to prioritize efforts where we can have the widest impact. So um, to conclude, I hope that we can really uh, continue working. We have had a super uh, good collaboration in the past. I hope we can continue this collaboration and we need to work together more than ever to make sure that we're going towards the target. Thank you for this. Well, thank you, Susanna, for giving us the, this update and uh, comment on, on um, uh, uh, what we heard earlier today uh, from the Commission's perspective. Uh, our next two speakers will be Dr. Luisa uh, Bastos, Animals in Science Program Leader at Eurogroup for Animals, and also my dear colleague Tilly Metz, uh, the Chairwoman of the Animal Welfare Intergroup's Animals in Science Working Group. They will speak about the needs uh, for a plenary debate and a linked motion for a resolution that could be introduced by uh, an oral question on plans and actions to accelerate the transition to innovation without the use of animals in research, regula uh, regulatory testing and education, uh, which is due to be tabled very, very soon. Uh, we will start with uh, Dr. Bastos. Um, uh, Luisa, the floor is yours. Luisa, you're muted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anya, and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, everybody is uh, seeing my slides? Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's see if this 
I can transition. Yes, okay. Um, so we've, uh, we have already heard during this meeting uh, about some of the big issues with ensuring the basic welfare of animals in laboratories from Katie and Carrie, and how this can lead to, to shocking behaviors. And we also heard from uh, Susanna Luimis, who uh, so kindly agreed to be here today, uh, to tell us about the efforts and actions from the Commission, not only to try to improve the treatment of these animals, but also to promote alternatives to their use. But it also became clear that, well, what the current context tells us is that there is still considerable lack of progress in replacing the use of animals in science in the EU. And this continues despite the intentions and the, com and the commitments, not only from the European Commission, but also from very active member states. We have a clear intention in the directive to fully replace the use of animals. We hear this in every presentation on this, uh, on this theme for a reason. And we've also, we have been having commitments from the commission in this area to reduce the use of animals for some decades. Some of them came in reply to the ECI stop TV section, recognizing, for example, the potential in considering deadlines to phase out animal testing in specific areas. So why are we still seeing so little progress if so many people are taking action? This lack of progress happens because despite the rapid emergence of advanced non-animal models, uh, these scientific developments are not sustained by coordinated plans to reduce and replace the use of animals in specific areas. And so one of the aims of the Animals in Science Working Group of this intergroup was to engage with relevant stakeholders to put forward concrete recommendations for the adoption of an effective strategy to transition to non-animal science. And after listening to several stakeholders and experts, some basic elements of such a plan became, began to take shape. And we heard already some of them also during during the previous presentations. And they include the identification and prioritization of key research areas to know where resources and efforts need to be targeted based on current knowledge and challenges that we are facing. And we know that there's already lots of sources of knowledge that we can take from the statistics, from reviews on an animal models, and in the future, we hope also from thematic reviews. Uh, it also includes setting ambitious and realistic goals to phase out the use of animals in these specific areas to help to motivate and drive coordinated multidisciplinary activities towards those goals. Unsurprisingly, it also includes funding, funding, funding and more funding. Um, an appropriate level of fund funding is needed to support the development and uptake of these new models and technologies, while at the same time, gradually discouraging funding in, of animal experimentations in specific areas where we know more needs to be done now. And lastly, um, there's also a big support, um, a big need to invest in large scale support for building key infrastructures that can allow a fuller exploitation of innovative non-animal models and technologies, giving all relevant researchers access to these models. And lastly, but certainly top on the priorities is the need to increase synergies. We've heard about the need to increase synergies between uh, all DGs, that have an impact on animal experimentation. Uh, there's also, we've also heard about the need to increase synergies between member states. We also need to increase synergies between stakeholders to reach people in all relevant roles to help educate, train, and provide confidence in the use of these new advanced non-animal models. 
And to get all these elements together, the EU needs a comprehensive policy program to phase out animal experiments. And we all know this will be a long process and that's one more reason why it needs to start now. And with this, I would like to pass the floor to, uh, to Tilly Metz, uh, MEP and Chairwoman of the Animals in Science Working Group. Are you with us, Tilly? Yes, I am completely Thank with you. you. Thank you very much, Louisa. Um, yeah, I hope you can see and hear me. All good. Perfect. Yes, perfect. Um, yes, first of all, um, yeah, my reaction to the Bibliotechnia uh, pictures, I must say only say pictures because I couldn't look uh, at, the, at the movie at the end. Um, I, I'm feeling too much ashamed and, and desperate. And um, yeah, it, it drives me quite crazy, I must say. And, and, and what really helps me, to be honest, are people like you. Um, I, I know that there are people like you um, fighting. Um, yeah, so I feel less alone in this fight and that there are other people working on alternatives. And that gives me the push to be, to be, to be still there, I would like to say, because when you see those pictures, you don't want to be a human being anymore. I'm, I'm too, feeling too much ashamed then. And, uh, because we have seen, and, and thank you for uh, the representative, uh, Susanna Luhimis, I hope Luhimis, I, I, I probably mispronounced the name um, for this presentation. We have indeed progressive text. Uh, we have indeed to collect better uh, um, data, data and to make more studies and to make trainings. That is all good and it's perfect. But I think now it, it's really time to act also. And, and if I see those pictures, you, you might know that I'm a chair of an inquiry committee, but I, I think we need also an inquiry committee uh, regarding uh, the, the use of animal in, in science. We cannot tolerate this, this going on for millions of animals. It, it's just too much. We also know um, that there are also in the commission other persons. I, I, I really like also when I hear the EFSA speaking, who, who really try to make more coordination between the DGs, who, uh, who also ask for concrete roadmap for the phasing out of animal testing, who want the better cooperation also between uh, the agencies, knowing that uh, ECA, to be honest, has very limited efforts to achieve uh, the same target. So there we have already a problem. Um, ECA and the Commission have in their power to, to ensure an effective implementation of the REACH and the cosmetic regulations. But we need, so let me just expose five main points maybe, uh, we need really concrete uh, objectives for the reduction of uh, the use of animals in science. And we need uh, more proactive implementation of those regulation in order really to have to see progress, knowing that the uh, uh, chemical strategy will more likely to be to increase the number of animals used uh, for testing. So it's very important that we set concrete targets. And then it was already mentioned also by uh, Luisa, the need to invest more in, in research. Um, under Horizon Europe and other research and innovation initiative funding of scientific projects making use of advanced non-animal models should be gradually increased and prioritized. We need them to be priorities. I know there is already a lot of happening in the GSA and I was myself visiting um, in the north of Italy, what they are doing there on, and, and testing non-animal testing and showing how effective they are. Um, it was already also discussed, it takes time to change mentalities and therefore we need specific training, we need a more multidisciplinary um, approach to the to all that in order to promote key competencies and knowledge required. Um, we have that already in other areas. Um, the, so we can also do that here. Education is certainly not enough. We also need a better coordination among the member states to establish together a plan uh, in research and, and to put really together the member states, the priorities, and also to um, the resource allocation, and it was already mentioned also by Luisa, is essential. 
For example, the Commission has published a plan to deepen the European research area and select priority areas of action with member states. Bathing out the use of animals should really become a long-term priority action. And then also, and that's my, my fifth point, also the private sector, we need to have them on board, plays an important role here, uh, also for promoting innovation without the use of animals. Through the European Innovation Council and the European Partnership for Alternative Approaches to Animal uh, Testing, for example, the private sector can be directly involved in a long term plan to phase out the use of animals. So those are also those people I speak about. There are scientists, there are companies who want also these changes, so we really should support them. And then I really um, use this opportunity also to thank all the people here in the science working group and in the intergroup um, who really continuously supporting our objective to promote the adoption of a comprehensive and concrete EU strategy to face out the use of animal in science. It's only when we do that together and putting pressure together that, that we may succeed. Um, and at the end, I would really like to make a call, and uh, the Anya mentioned it already, make a call to all of you just to not forget to add your electronic signature to the oral question that MEP Jutta Gutteland uh, will submit now on plans and actions to accelerate a transition to innovation without the use of animals in research, uh, regulatory testing and education. It's really important uh, to have all your supports and that we get the discussion in the plenary. Ideally, it would really be before the break, uh, the summer break, and linked to a motion for a resolution that takes into account the elements that were all just uh, presented. So we really have to make now these steps and a concrete roadmap reality in order really to change something. So that I really hope that in the future, we won't see any more uh, those pictures we had to, to face out because they are hurting a lot. They are hurting a lot, of course, a lot of suffering from millions of animals. They're hurting a lot of human beings too. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Louisa and Tilly for your um, uh, presentations. And also I would like to thank all other um, uh, guests for their informative presentation and especially Cruelty Free Europe um, for making us face the facts of the day-to-day -day situation in so many um, uh, uh, European laboratories. Um, I now open the floor for questions and debates and I will go over to Reineke. Are there any questions from uh, MEPs or from the audience? Thank you, uh, Anja, and indeed lots of questions also from the audience. Uh, but before uh, I will move to those, I would like to invite MEP Bruna to come in and make her intervention. Merci. Um, bonjour, Madame la Présidente. Bonjour à tous. Uh, I would like to speak in English, but uh, sorry for my English, it's a little bit difficult for me. So I would like to speak to you about the topic. A few days ago, I watched the appeal of a woman suffering from muscular dystrophy, who was telling for an, for, excuse me, for an end to animal testing in order to put into practice the innovations of biotechnology, in particular in vitro method. Indeed, indeed to combat myopathy, Currently, tests on dogs have proved to be totally ineffective and, and have only resulted in increased sufferings for the animals tested. The result is catastrophic. Decades of research into myopathy have failed to find a cure for the disease. But this research has led to the death of thousands of dogs in atrocious and unacceptable conditions. In the same way, it's no it's now known that more than 80% of molecules successfully tested on mice fell in human clinical trials. Man is not a 70 kilo rat, as one toxicologist ironically remarked. In fact, the 3RS method for replacement reduction and refinement take a while to be applied, especially when it comes to replacement. 
But isn't it the European Union itself that facilitates the inertia? Indeed, if laboratories remain stuck on their old methods of testing on animals, it's also because the states are mandatory to obtain the famous marketing authorizations. The situation is completely high wire since states on animals, which everyone knows are ineffective and cruel, are carried out of the out for the sole purpose of, us, of satisfying an administrative whim. I would like so to ask you, how can we convince the European Commission to change the legislation on the marketing of medicines and chemicals? Is there any reason why the Commission should not take account of technologic, technological progress, especially in the field of molecular bio, biology? Thank you very much, and sorry. <laughs> no problem at all. Thank you so much, MEP Bruna, for your very valid question, because indeed, uh, we talked a lot about animal uh, cruelty uh, today, but there are also huge issues uh, with the translatability of uh, the animal uh, model. Um, and you have a specific question about what more can we do to convince uh, the Commission uh, to adopt more non-animal approaches. And I'm looking at the panel um, to see who would like to come in uh, on that. Um, Louisa, you want to give a reaction? Yes, I can start. And um, I'm sure that, um, that uh, Gary, Katie and Tilly will have uh, um, other things to add. It is indeed it is indeed troubling and uh, and known for some time now um, that um, well animal experiments of uh, of disease don't uh, don't lead to significant um, treatments or effective treatments for humans. There are. There are things that can be done, but that um, are not really working at the time. So we have this knowledge, we have these reviews, we understand the problems. Um, the problems may be intrinsically with the models themselves, they may be with the design of the experiments. Um, but what the choice we are not making yet is to act on that knowledge. We have these reviews showing this, um, these poor translatability results. It should lead to effective scientific policies that will discourage the use of more animals for that research field and trying to promote these innovative methods without, uh, that do not rely on the use of animals that are already showing a great potential to better understand uh, human diseases and find uh, new treatments. But this, this shift needs to be, again, based on policies. And until now, both member states and the commission um, are not making that choice. So that would be one of the... Mm one of the first things to do. I don't know, Carrie, Katie, do you want to? Thank you, Louisa. Um, thanks for that. We have lots of more questions. So I would like to ask the panelists the other question. In fact, uh, one from Andre uh, that very much relates to you, uh, what you just mentioned, Louisa. He's asking the replacement of animals for the potency testing of Botox is an example uh, what industry is capable uh, to do uh, when it's motivated to do so. And the biggest obstacle to the replacement of animals in regulatory toxicology is not a lack of technology, but a lack of political will uh, by governments and industry. Um, a first step towards making progress would be a parliamentary inquiry, yes, Dilly, another one, into the validity of the animal model and the av availability of alternative methods. Uh, maybe Tilly, you can come in uh, on this. What do you think of such a proposal? Would that help, you think? Um, clearly, um, I think we have to be more proactive. Uh, would it be through an inquiry committee? We saw, we saw now in this crisis, if we really want to change something, we are able to change things. Huh? So you, we must just put it as a 
political priority. So I totally agree when we are saying it's not that we don't have the technology, it's more about changing mentalities. It's really so deeply in the, in the tradition to use animals for testing. And, and that is something we have to change and we have to tackle it from, from different perspective. Uh, in 2020, only 0.1% of the budget of the horizon was uh, dedicated to alternative methods on animal testing. That's not making a priority of something. And I think really the citizens are waiting for us outside there that we act. So it could, it could really be a win-win-win situation um, for the citizens, for the EU institutions, and of course for the millions of animals. So, but it's really that we have to change those mentalities who still think that we need animal testing. And I completely agree with the Annika when she's saying, no, we are not 80 kilos, or this taxologist say we are not 80 uh, kilo heavy uh, rats. So it's, it's totally inefficient and we know that. Uh, a lot of testing also that has been done on, on uh, trying vaccines uh, regarding AIDS are totally inefficient because they, they were successful with monkeys, but they didn't then with humans. So, and also, especially regarding uh, neurological diseases, uh, the life of the human being is much more complex than, uh, and there was a lot of factors influencing when you get Parkinson or Alzheimer, also regarding your lifestyle, stress factors, psychological factors. So we are definitely not comparable in that way uh, really to, to wreck because there were so many different factors of our lifestyle also influencing. But it's a hard work um, really making this change of mentalities. But that's what we have to do as an, an uh, and also investing more in, in showing the efficiency of um, non-animal testing, of course. Sorry, I was too long now. No, 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 no. Uh, I, I, I say really sometimes I'm so desperate that uh, we should really act. And I have a small question. I didn't get that. Is the Vivo uh, Technic, Technia still open or did they close it at least now? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question, uh, Tilly, and it also links to something Nicholas uh, is asking, and maybe, uh, Katie, you can come in uh, on this. Uh, how is it that uh, the inspectors uh, did not see that something was wrong uh, because uh, they, they must have visited uh, this, this premise? And maybe you can also react to Tilly's question, what's happening at the moment? Is this laboratory still operating? Thank you. Yes, I, yes, I can answer that. I think I think the investigation does does highlight problems with uh, with the inspection regime, not not just in Spain actually, because we've seen this in other countries such as the UK and, and Germany, uh, that inspectors are, are are not going in frequently enough. And unfortunately, as you as you'll know, in uh, when we were discussing uh, the the new directive, uh, we what we wanted to see uh, tighter tighter inspections and more frequent inspections but actually what what came out of the directive I think is a, I believe a, a third of establishments um, every year so that in, that could mean that an establishment is not invest is not looked at um, more frequently than once every three years uh, we understand that uh, Vivid Technia wasn't in um, was last invested uh, inspected sorry, in 2019. So we've got an issue with frequency of inspections and it's unfortunate that the directive itself didn't impose tighter requirements across all member states for that. And obviously if member states are not prioritizing the implementation of the directive in their countries, then they will just do the bare minimum. Um, so that's really unfortunate. And I think we're seeing that, we're certainly sort of seeing that in Spain uh, when they have, they have other priorities. Um, and particularly with the, you know, with the COVID crisis, we're very concerned that um, inspectors are not going into facilities and perhaps haven't been into facilities for more than a year uh, because of the COVID crisis. Um, but why, why didn't the inspectors pick up these problems? And uh, Suzanne is absolutely right. It is possible for um, the laboratory, if they're so inclined, to cover up a lot of poor practices they're certainly not unlikely to be abusive to the animals in front of an inspector um, they certainly have time to sort themselves out to some degree but I'm very distressed because in the last three investigations that we've done there are clear problems with laboratories such as cage sizes being not not right lack of enrichment I mean that's that's basic 
So I'm very, very concerned that there's something very, very wrong. And I think inspectors are, they're not doing their job. And I think all of this is undermining the directive, um, mm. you know. Yeah. And can you say a bit more, Kitty, about what's happening now? Are there still uh, uh, animals in this establishment? Yeah, thank you. Um, we understand that they've they've suspended the license and perhaps there's no new projects going on. We're a bit concerned that um, current experiments are continuing. The animals have certainly not been rehomed, which is causing a lot of distress to um, the public in, in Madrid who are desperate for these, these animals to be released you know, pending the, the final in, uh, inquiry. So it's, it's, it's suspended, but the level of suspension we're not, uh, we're not clear on. And um, uh, we're, we're hoping uh, that maybe the commission can help us uh, next week clarify what, what's going on there. Mm, thank you, Katie. And can you say anything about when we expect this investigation uh, to, to be finished and also to be communicated? No, that's a big no. concern for us. Mm. The, these can, things can often take some time and uh, maybe Susanna could, could help um, help us get clarity on that from, from the mm. Spanish authorities. Uh, that would be very helpful. Thank you, Katie. In fact, we also have another question to Susanna um, because Roland is asking on transparency, um, how could this uh, be controlled by the Commission? How can the quality and the comprehensiveness of the statistics submitted by uh, the member states be controlled and how do we know that this is accurate? Um, could, you, could you say a bit about that, Susanna? Maybe also come back to the question about when you think, if you know when the investigation into uh, vivotechnia will, will be finished? Thank you for these questions, uh, all important. Um, for Vivotecnia, it is the Spanish authorities who are in charge of the um, of the pros process and the progress of the process. Um, we have made formal uh, inquiry to the uh, Spanish authorities asking more information and clarity, but unfortunately I don't have more information at this stage in terms of where we are with the process. Um, on statistics, um, that's something that uh, I take very, uh, very strongly to my heart. I, I, I think that it is very true that if you get rubbish in, it's rubbish out. So we really need to be very good at controlling what kind of data we um, get in. With the member states, we have a number of tools. We have developed tools for them to control uh, different elements of it. So we, they can highlight areas where there's a big change. Uh, if um, when I'm getting the statistics into our our, our hands, I actually personally go through some of the statistics. I'm looking at combinations that shouldn't happen. I'm looking at uh, strange numbers. I go bilaterally back to the member states. As last, last week, I was going back to one member state about something that they have reported. So it is definitely something that um, I take very, I don't take lightly and, and we want to control as much as possible. Of course, uh, there is always a chance that there's something which is incorrect. Uh, there's also issues of understanding the reporting. Um, as you know, the directive introduces severity reporting and one of the elements which is a non-recovery was very much misunderstood in the beginning. And so, so for example, it, it does take work in, again, it's, there's no one solution to any problem. It requires work in different areas. We provide guidance documents, we have the discipline discussions and now with um, a new uh, guidance document that we are currently putting together which is on genetically altered animals um, part of the guidance document is also looking at again reporting what are the administrative procedures which should be covered by the project authorization and how you are supposed to report them in the statistics as well as in the um, five-year reports um, so yes um, we are doing an enormous amount of efforts to make sure that the, the quality of the statistical data is reliable Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. And could you uh, elaborate a bit on how you think that data collection and more transparency could help to better protect animals? There are several elements which I feel that the statistics as well as non-technical summaries will be helping us. Uh, I said earlier about areas of high volume usage, areas of high severities. What are those areas? What can we learn about them? Where can, can we put resource funding, research funding into those areas? Um, statistics also, we talked about the fact that we have to use an alternative when it is available. And especially in the area of uh, toxicology and, and regulatory testing, that is an area where we can use the statistics directly to start seeing 
are there animals use certain species for certain endpoints, which should no longer be the case. And we go back to the member states regularly. We work over the member states twice uh, yearly meetings. And part of the sort of regular agenda points is to discuss areas where alternatives are available and they should be used. And we still see statistics uh, mentioning uh, antibody production, mentioning pyrogenesis testing, um, skin eye irritation, you know, the very regular ones. And we talk about this regularly and we try to devise more tools to the member state authorities as well, how they can make sure that within these uh, longer authorizations, uh, these can be tackled. Thank you, Susanna, for clarifying that. Uh, Anya, you have a follow-up question for Susanna, right? Yes, thank you, Reineke, that's correct. Uh, well, after seeing the, the footage from FIFO Technia and, and LPT in Germany uh, as well, um, we can conclude that there is not only um, and not only the animals are, are abused in a cruel way, but we can also have to question the validity of the results of the studies. And uh, for instance, LPT in Germany was involved in a lot of research related to EU policies. For instance, the reauthorization of glyphosate, um, the pesticide. And I was wondering, um, does the European Commission or the, uh, still use the data uh, of results uh, from the regulatory testing in LPT or FIVO uh, Technia uh, uh, in decision making processes? And, and if so, why? Unfortunately, I would not be able to answer to that. It depends on who are the clients, so what are they using the data for? Is it for EMA submission? Is it for the ECA submission? Uh, that level of detail, I would not be able to answer, unfortunately. Thank you, uh, Susanna. Thank you so much. Um, we have a related question uh, to this because uh, someone is saying that some of the tests as uh, shown uh, in the video are still allowed uh, in uh, the EU and uh, are indeed inherently cruel. Um, and that the only solution is that these tests will just get prohibited. Um, why is this not happening and how can we uh, make sure that uh, our political leaders will take such uh, decisions? Uh, Katie, would you like to come in on that maybe or, or Carrie? Ryan, could you just re repeat the, uh, the, the yes. question? I'm sure. sorry, I was looking sure. at the chat. Yeah, Apologies. no worries. Constanza is saying that um, some of the tests as shown in the video, such as the inhalation toxicity test, um, that this is a normal procedure and the same goes for eye irritation in rabbits. Um, and she's saying that, um, so improving welfare is not the solution to stop this cruelty. We should simply stop those tests. Um, in particular, considering that um, accepted alternatives do exist. Um, so for some of these tests, uh, we just need to make sure that the uh, non-animal model will be used. Uh, how can we make that reality? Yep, yep. And that's, that's something that we've, we've very much highlighted in our report to the authorities mm. and, we, and we've highlighted to, to Susanna as well. We, we, we can already see based in, on the EU statistics that there are several animal tests for which there are validated accepted alternatives and yet those animal tests persist. There's various reasons for that. Occasionally, the, there are instances where the alternative is is not suitable um, for um, you know physical chemical reasons. Um, but uh, particularly worrying uh, to us is that um, there seems to be a permissive attitude towards uh, testing chemicals and drugs uh, on animals for non-EU countries that will not accept the alternative. And I think that's completely unacceptable and something that we really need to to highlight. Um, so we do have we do have an, a, a problem with enforcement, and, and I believe that is a role for the Commission, uh, but but also for member states. And as Costanza highlighted, uh, much of what is in the video is is standard standard toxicity testing. Whether Vivitechnia are in breach of of uh, their license or, or animal welfare. It is up to the authorities to decide. I believe they are, they are in, in some cases, even of those standard procedures. Um, but it is important for people to, to realize that much of what is in the video is standard. Um, so this is not just a bad apple. No, no, thank you. Thanks for that, uh, Katie. 
Um, I see that Telly, you have raised your hand. Feel free to come in. Would you like to yes. comment? Yeah, I, I was reading in the chat uh, in the chat from Kirk Leach, uh, who mentioned that uh, the testing on monkeys were important to have no vaccine against COVID-19. So uh, my question would really be to him, please show me of, of, of the evidence that there was no other method, uh, even maybe more efficient and more rapid, showing, for example, working directly with human cells uh, rather than on monkeys. Um, yeah, because that's what people are saying. Yeah, uh, always, it's always the argument. I, if it would have been your mother, your child, would you uh, then still agree of not using animals in testing? Of course not, because I think it's not only an ethical issue, it's also an issue of to be efficient in, in research. So prove me via Kirk Leach, I was already in a fast uh, fast with him now in a, in a, in a journal, uh, that there was no other method not using animal testing available and even maybe more efficient. And then I just used the opportunity to, to really thank uh, the whistleblower and also cruelty free, um, because that's what we need. We need to show the people what's really happening. And I'm so grateful that you are doing uh, this work with a lot of, of you have a lot uh, of courage and, and really thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Telly. And indeed, um, lots of respect for the whistleblower. And it is uh, very good that Susanna mentioned that there will be new EU legislation to better protect whistleblowers. I think that is very important. Um, now, I would like to touch upon another very interesting question uh, posed by uh, Francois uh, Busquet. Uh, he's asking, and maybe this is a good one for you, Kerry, um, what could be adequate metrics to monitor progress in three hours, or maybe just replacement, uh, besides animal uh, numbers and funding? Do you have ideas about that? How could we use certain indicators to, to measure progress in this area? I, mean, I think the... <laughs> I think numbers and funding are, 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 are crucial. Um, and I think it was interesting that Susanna was talking about the role that transparency can play. And I think one of my concerns is that we have over the past few years had transparency surrounding the number of animals used in science in, in the EU, but we haven't acted on that transparency and transparency is only useful in so far as it drives change. So I know that Katie, for example, has done some work on calculating if we carry on at the current percentage rate of change in the number of experiments that animals are used in in Europe, it will take, correct me if I'm wrong, Katie, but something like 80 to 100 years before we achieve um, the ultimate goal in the recital in the directive. So uh, transparency around numbers is important, but only if it drives change um, and who's going to drive that change. And I think transparency and joined upness around funding is critical. So I think Tilly rightly made the point about the tiny percentage of funding in Horizon 2020 that's used specifically for non-animal methods and which pales into complete insignificance compared to the amount of funding that goes on projects using animal studies and animal models. Um, and I think one of the, uh, the things that the EU should think about is that kind of joining up of its policy commitment with what it actually does. So if we really are committed to reducing and replacing, why are we spending so much uh, EU research funding on uh, animal models still? Why are laboratories like Vivo Technia in receipt of European regional funding? But I think the other thing that we need to look at, uh, and there's been some talk about inquiries and so on and so forth, is that we have, we have existing legislation that we should be using as, um, as indicators that we aren't currently using properly. So REACH, for example, thanks to animal protection groups and the parliament has a commitment to animal testing as a last resort, has a commitment to prioritizing the use of non-animal methods, but that's not working. It's clearly not working. It's clearly not being enforced. So before we look at new inquiries and new things, let's make what we have work properly particularly as the Commission is about to reopen the cosmetics regulation, for example, where we know what the position of parliamentarians is and we know what the position of the public is. 
but reopening, reopening it for new endpoints could lead to even more animal testing. Likewise, I think one of the indicators that we should all be living by is all the, the, the new initiatives around the chemical strategy and the pharmaceutical strategy that are silent on animal testing. And that could lead to tests on millions more animals. So I think, you know, we need to use what we've got and improve what we've, what we've got to make sure that, that um, we're seeing the change that we want to see. Thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Carrie. Um, and indeed, we have a lot uh, we can better implement. Um, I see, Telly, that you got an invitation to uh, meet with some researchers to discuss um, uh, the need for um, animal models. Uh, so it's, it's in the chat. Uh, and I also see that there are still lots and lots of comments and questions, uh, Anya, but I'm afraid that time is up. We need to wrap up. Uh, I hope we can continue uh, the debate after this meeting because uh, as we have learned today, a lot still has to be done and we need you all. You know, we can't do this uh, on our own. We really need to go for a joined up uh, approach. So thank you all. And I'm handing back uh, to you, Anja. Well, thank you, Reineke. Yes, indeed, we, we need more, more time to discuss uh, these topics. And um, uh, let me just summarize what we heard today. It was clear from today's presentations that the implementation of Directive 2010-63 still uh, leaves much room for improvement and that it is difficult, even with a legislation that intends to protect animals used in science, to ensure that these animals in laboratories are cared for in the best possible way. Um, we learned about the Commission's plans to improve the, pro uh, uh, the protection of these animals, and we learned that how that may not be enough if we want to see significant progress in replacing uh, the use of animals in science. We were presented with ways in which the EU can achieve effective reduction in, uh, of animals in science, and I hope that the members of this intergroup will provide all the support necessary to the oral question being now submitted, uh, submitted by uh, colleague um, uh, MEP uh, Jutta Guteland. Um, uh, to achieve a position of the European Parliament calling for an EU action plan to accelerate a transition uh, to innovation without the use of animals in research, regulatory testing and education. Um, before I close the meeting, I'd like to tell you that the Animal Welfare Intergroup uh, will hold its next monthly uh, session on Thursday, the 1st of July from 12 to 1. And MEP uh, Jeremy uh, Desserle will present his draft report on the implementation uh, of on-farm animal welfare related uh, legislation. There will be exceptionally also interpretation in French. Uh, further information about this meeting will be sent to you in due course. So thank you again for attending this meeting and I wish you all a very, very nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye everyone.